14th regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Um, I was going to ask for a roll call, but our clerk has I'll disappeared. Do it. Okay, um, well, I'll do it. Um, David Backer? Here. Cynthia Dill? Sarah Lennon? Here. Paul McKenney? James Jim Rowe? Here. And Anne Swift Kayata? Here. Here. And I would just mention that uh, I know Councillor McKenney is at National Guard duty. So, um, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, the first item on our agenda is the minutes of our June 26, 2008 meeting. David? I move the approval of our June 26, 2008 meeting. Second. Discussion? All in favor? He has the Oh, sorry, Jim. Uh, page three. There was just a, a repetition of one phrase there in the top line. Um, He's going to to authorize the town manager to authorize the town manager. Just, we can just clean that up. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, with that amendment, all in favor? Be 5 0. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is uh, reports and correspondence. Are there any reports, correspondence, Jim? Uh, I had the pleasure of attending the annual uh, caucus or annual meeting of the Greater Portland Council of Governments, and I'm happy to report that. Uh, Councillor Paul McKenney, who is not here tonight, was re-elected president of that group this year. Thank you. Anything else? No? Town managers? Uh, no report. Okay. Um, citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. If there is anyone here who would like to discuss any item that is not on our agenda, now is the time to do that. We do have a period at the end of our meeting um, also for citizens to discuss items not on our agenda. But seeing none, we will go to a uh, public hearing, item 96, which is a public hearing on the two windmill proposals. So I'll open that public hearing now. If anyone would like to speak, please come up and state your name and address. Bill Downs, 15 Old Colony Lane. Um, my first issue is that the ordinances address single installations and the specs required thereof. I haven't seen anything that addresses what happens if we have a concentration of 15 or 20 of these turbines in the same neighborhood. Has anybody been in touch with PUC to look at possible overloads? Second issue is there is nothing in the comprehensive plan that addresses alternative or renewable energy for the town. <clears throat> it's quite clear that the town wants to maintain its bucolic rural character, but sticking up 100 foot towers throughout the town, I think, is going to significantly distort or change that. I can understand when we put up the cellular tower that there was a safety issue involved and there was a public good involved. When you have individuals putting up towers on private property, it benefits only that individual, nobody else. I know there's a common belief that wind power reduces or eliminates emissions. It does not. <clears throat> I've been in touch with the Energy Information Administration and the Lawrence Berkeley Labs, and they have both confirmed there is no empirical evidence or data to support any claims whatsoever that wind power reduces CO2. And the reason for that is, in order to reduce CO2, the grid operators must be able to get advance notice to reduce the use of their fossil fuel plants. And it is just not practical from a, the standpoint of the utilities to shut down plants for 16, 18 hours when typically wind power only generates for a few hours at a time. And then my last issue is that, to, in, with respect to uh, 
wind power, if you're going to allow individuals with these very attractive tax shelters, then I think you re need to reclassify the properties as business use because nobody else is going to benefit. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on the topic of windmills, either either of the proposed ordinances? Good evening. My name is Jack Roberts. I'm at 185 Paula Road in a wind tunnel. And I thank you for opening us up to public hearing this evening. I'm not sure my comments directly affect either one of the ordinance changes, but I still want, I'd like to speak anyway. Earlier today, I'd gone down to Arundel looking into solar panels, so I'm not just here on looking into wind. I'm trying to look into each and every aspect of ways to reduce the, the use of oil. There was a story on the news this evening, prior to coming over here, indicating that due to the price of the oil, we, have the, we are having right now the greatest transfer of wealth in human history. And it's, really, it's going to affect everything that we do in this country for years to come. People are complaining about windmills, and I don't really understand why. A windmill 35 feet high is no taller than your average typical utility pole, and yet you don't hear people screaming about those being out in their front yards. If we used a minimum setback of 35 feet, and then it increased it by a foot for every, uh, every foot in, uh, additional in height, it's going to limit the number of places that you can put them. Just the fact that a person has to have the adequate amount of wind is going to limit where people are going to put them. We're not talking thousands of windmills cropping up all over Cape Elizabeth. We don't have the luxury of taking baby steps. Sorry, Jim. <clears throat> but 150 gallons of fuel oil today costs $675. That is well beyond the means of a lot of Maine residents and a lot of Cape Elizabeth residents. It may not be concerned to the folks on the council, or a lot of folks in Cape Elizabeth, but it's a concern to myself and a lot of other people. We can't just be spending this money and shipping it out of the country. We need all levels of government to start showing some leadership. We need bold and creative initiatives, not roadblocks from government stopping people from trying to alleviate our dependence on foreign oil. One windmill here, one solar collector there, uh, granted, they don't add up much or take much off the grill, but you do that a thousand times or a million times over, and we've reduced a significant amount of that oil that we're now purchasing from other countries. As David said last, at the last meeting, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind and in the sun and a number of other resources that we have out there. But we can't use them if there are ordinances that prohibit us from doing so. I ask you to please don't put this on hold too long. Allow us to put up windmills or allow us to put up solar panels. If you recall, a gentleman in Scarborough put up solar panels and people were complaining about that. Everything people want to do to reduce the dependence on some kind of on oil, it seems to affect somebody else's sensibilities. Well, the biggest sensibility we need to worry about are our wallets. And I thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. I think, for, for the record, I think that um, Solar panels are permitted in people's homes. But thank you. My point was that in certain jurisdictions, everything that people try is being shut back down. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on windmills? It helps if you can form a line and no. Good evening. My name is Ann Carney. I live on 21 Angel Point Road. And I'd just like to briefly say that I do support both of the windmill ordinances that are before the town council. I think it's very important for Cape Elizabeth to allow uh, its citizens and also for the town itself to explore alternative energy sources. We could be a, take on a leadership role in the state of Maine in this area. And I, I think both the ordinances should be passed. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Alan? Thank you. My, my name is Alan Leishness, and I live at 21 Cottage Farms Road in Cape Elizabeth. 
And I'm here to speak in support of both wind energy ordinances. I serve on the Cape Elizabeth Alternative Energy Committee, but I'm speaking tonight as a private citizen because we've not had an opportunity to meet and discuss a, a, a concerted statement. First to the question of uh, a municipal wind installation, I think it would be important uh, for the council to consider as tall a tower as it's willing to consider because uh, power from the wind is a cube function. So when the wind speed doubles, the output of the wind machine is increased by eight times. And um, typical wind regimes indicate much higher winds at, at higher altitudes. So I would, I would suggest the, if, if you can see your way to, to consider a, a tower taller than 30 meters, uh, the machine would probably perform a lot better. Secondly, to the question of private installation uh, with conformance to common sense zoning regulations already in place, for instance, uh, decibel levels at property lines, I would encourage the council to kind of open up the thinking about whether we want the whole community to participate. The fact is there are tens of thousands of windmills installed around the world. Several thousand of them have been installed for several decades. It's not that we're going to learn a lot by installing one windmill, but we'll learn a lot more if the entire community participates. And to the notion that, that tall towers are a problem in our community and, and unsightly, I would point to Portland Headlight as the defining uh, visual element of our community. And finally, I would, I, 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 my concern is that we're, we're kind of dealing with, the, with very small questions here. This is the defining issue of our time. It calls for big ideas. I think Cape Elizabeth is a town that has both the will and the resources to become energy independent. And as an example, I would cite a small Swedish town, a small island, I'm sorry, a small island off the coast of Denmark called Samso. In 1998, they recognized that they were spending too much on oil, which arrived by tanker. In 10 short years, they have become net energy producers. Uh, so I think rather than debating to the death whether we like what windmills look like or, or not, I think it's time to, to get on with the job of understanding how to power the community from renewable resources. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Good evening. My name is Gordon Hurtubies, Three Singles Road, Cape Elizabeth. Recently I did an energy audit at my home to find out where all the money was going. I now at 4,000 kilowatts per month average all year long. I'm burning about 3,000 gallons of oil right now. I have an older home, large, and it's very difficult to do too many things to it to save energy unless you start all over again on the insulation and things like that, which I've done. I'm in favor of wind power. I'm in a location that would be very nice to have a, a wind uh, generating plant out there, and I don't think that I affect my neighbors, but I think there are some places that people might find offensive. I, I think it ought to be on a case-by-case -case and let people decide that way. I mean, I, I really think that if we can save money, you figure out how much I'm paying a month and a year, and how much I'm paying taxes out here in Cape Elizabeth, I'll do everything I can to save money to live in Cape Elizabeth. And I'm retired now, so uh, please, if you could think about it, uh, it's not a bad thing. I think we're all facing the high energy costs. I think we could do something about it. It's an individual thing. It's expensive. You're going to hear from probably somebody up here that's going to cost fifty thousand dollars to twenty thousand dollars to put one of these things in. But the way the oil's going, it might, the payback might be sooner than what you think. So, thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Pat Selby Bell, and I live on 90 Ocean House Road, and we are the people that have a windmill in town. Um, I sent all of you a packet. I trust that you received it and got a chance to look at it. Um, since I sent that packet, Stephen read our meters. We've got a system of five meters on our house because we do sell back to CMP. Since 1984, our windmill has only created 65,045 kilowatts of electricity. That's not a lot for that machine. That machine has the capability of producing 10,000 watts. Right. Can you repeat that? It's 65,045 kilowatts since 1984. Thank you. Our problem is that we live on Ocean House Road. If we lived at Kettle Cove or uh, Shore Acres or any of those other places, we'd have better wind. 
But for Stephen back in 1984 and since then for me, it's not been about a payback in that we're not going to get the $20,000 when you keep doing inflation and what that money could have earned. We're not going to get that money back in any time soon. What we look at is that that is 65,000 watts that did not have to be created with oil, that did not need natural gas. Um, and that's, that's real important to us. It's not always about a financial payback. And every single person has a, a right and a responsibility to do everything that they can do be, you know, be it recycling at the, at the recycling center and not just putting everything in the hopper when it's easier, um, shutting off lights in your house. All of the things that every one of us do, it's our responsibility. And I really get very nervous when the council looks at limiting people's ability to fulfill that responsibility. My tower is not attractive. We are very lucky in that it sits right behind our business, which can also not be attractive at times, depending on how many people have broken down that week. Um, towers today look different. I see that you've asked for monopoles. Um, our tower is a guide tower, which you would not allow. So those look very, very different. They're very clean looking. Um, and at 100 feet, you're talking about a very large flagpole type structure, more than the open lattice work that we decorate for Christmas. Um, so, you know, that, that's something. I just really want to reiterate that we stand firmly behind both of these ordinances that you've got before you. Not just one for the town, although we would be thrilled to see something go up either at the transfer station or on the school property, someplace where it can not only be creating electricity, but be a, a point of education for our community and for every community around us. Um, I, I, I just I really support both of these. But to have homeowners, when you're going to put up a windmill, if you're going to spend 20 or 30 or 40 or $50,000, you're going to do a study. And I think that you could even make that be a requirement if you, if you really felt like you needed to keep your thumb on this somewhat more. When you do that study, you're going to find out how much wind you've got. And if you're sitting in the middle of some neighborhood where you don't have wind, it's just not going to be at all feasible to do this. And for those people, I say, go to solar, go to some other. But I think this is going to be self-limiting, that you don't really need to just say no. Thank you. Thank you, Patsy. My name is uh, David Sanford. I live at One Charles Road, Cape. Um, I think it's an undeniable fact that we live at a period of special challenge and special opportunity in our country. There are a great many things that we're going to have to change in a relatively short time. And I think that uh, experimentation is, is key. Uh, there is probably no area in which experimentation and change is needed as much as it is in the exploration and the application of alternative sources of energy. Um, I want to suggest that uh, in, in, in support of these ordinances that if there are homeowners in the town who are willing to experiment, in this case with wind power, that that a useful attitude would be to think that they are people operating in the service of what's best for the community as people willing on their own to experiment in a relatively new area. I think a useful position would be for the council to develop some kind of a questionnaire in which Warren Roos and other people uh, if they're allowed to experiment with wind power, can periodically report back to the council uh, in response to questions which the council uh, puts forward. This is a new area having to do with, with uh, the application of wind power uh, in this community, in individual homes, and I think it could be, 
I, I think it would, could be very useful to have people who are willing to be pioneers locally in this area reporting back to the council. Um, thank you. Thank you. I'm Joyce Wilson Sanford. I live at 1 Charles Road, Cape Elizabeth, and I guess I am married to the man because our opinion is the same. <laughs> right here, right now. It's that like doesn't it. always fall. <laughs> it won't <That's> last. <laughs> Nor will it last. <laughs> but as a businesswoman, as an executive of Hannaford Brothers and the, and the parent company, we're frequently caught with um, trade-offs and with dilemmas that feel irresolvable. And what I've learned is to forward the action in order to deepen the learning. So I'm here in support of the ordinances and in support, as David said, of prudent experimentation overseen by this group so that you can pass the learning along quickly. And because I don't think we can continue to study, study, study. Um, always, I think of Hugh Farrington, who uh, used to live in this community, who was a great CEO of Hannaford, and he would say, where can we do the experiment? Where can we try something? so that we honestly, in a very tangible way, can see what will come from this. So if people are willing to assume that financial risk, I would like this board to think, how can we oversee that? How can we make it provisional so that they can recover their money? But if it isn't good, we can do something about that. Create a good environment for this kind of bold experimentation. We need it. And the other thing is, I can't think of anything more rural than a windmill. Talk about rural character. I think it adds a lot. I think they're quite beautiful if you uh, get used to the idea. And they look like the mast of a sailboat. So there. Thank you. My name's Jay Vreeland. I snuck over the border from Scarborough. So uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not a resident. Uh, I have spent the last 10 years since my retirement uh, trying to understand all the forms of renewable energy that are out there. Uh, I'm not here to, sp to speak pro or con. Wind obviously is a, is a coming uh, unit, both in terms of the huge megawatt systems uh, that are being installed presently up in the northern part of the state and uh, the home power units. Uh, what I'd like to point out though is wind power is all about location. Location, location, location. It's like real estate. Over in the, in the corner there, I've got a map of the state of Maine, and it shows the, the various wind power units. Um, wind power in the state of Maine basically is up on the mountain ridges and over the oceans. Um, as the wind comes ashore, uh, the area in white, which is most of the state of Maine, is class one, which Nobody recommends putting wind power in class one. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I hate to say you're throwing your money away, but it's not the place to do it. You know, I think you need to, and, and as one of the, the previous speakers, you really need to encourage people uh, to try to do it where they got the best chance at it. Um, the, just kind of a side light, the reason that, that uh, wind power is so strong along the coast, surprise, I, being a sailor, I thought it was sea breezes. Most of the wind power, uh, somebody mentioned wind, wind power goes up as the cube of the speed. Um, most of the wind power uh, along the coast comes in the winter and the spring from the nor'easters. Uh, that's when we get high intensity, lots of wind. And it's one of the reasons why if you look at that map over there, you see so much wind power uh, off the coast of Maine. Uh, the Cape has a sort of a unique position in southwestern Maine, uh, the area from Two Lights down to Kettle Cove is about the only really high wind power uh, area in town. And I, I tried to blow it up and show what the rest of the town would look like. Uh, there are some uh, other places to do it, but the whole, the whole technology of how you predict wind power is a fairly complex one. And I certainly don't understand it, but it's it's not an easy thing to do. As a minimum, as you get away from those proven areas, you really need to do a wind survey 
to protect yourself because even the best locations, which is my last point, even the best locations, cost return is pretty slow. I admire the people that are going to do it, but it's, I've heard people describe it, it's, it's not because they're going to make money on it, it's because they have a passion to do it. They just want to do it. And I think it's great to support those people. The, um, and I think I'll, I, could, I could wind up and, and give you another 40 minutes on wind power, but I'll, I'll refrain. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your emails in recent days. They've been helpful. Uh, good evening, Madam Chairman and Board Members. Uh, my name is Robert Gregg. Um, I am the distributor and uh, installer of most of the SkyStream wind turbines that have been put up in the state of Maine. Uh, I brought you folks some information which is of concern, probably, which would be uh, noise levels. Um, these turbines run in uh, no excess than 55 decimals. And I also brought you some photographs of a typical installation. Uh, as the gentleman said uh, before us, a lot of people that put up wind turbines put them up because they do have a passion for them. Uh, to be in an area where you've got the best wind in the state of Maine is uh, a hard thing to find. But there is a payback, uh, whether it's eight years or whether it's 16 years, uh, and that's based on today's energy costs. And we all know that's going to increase, so it'll shorten the period of return. Uh, another key factor that's entered into this in the last year or two is the cost of fuel. Uh, I have people that, that put up wind turbines that on five, six, seven days a month they're heating their house with their wind turbines because their wind turbine is running in excess and running enough energy to uh, allow them to heat the house with electric heaters, thereby uh, not uh, paying the oil man to fill up the uh, oil burn or the oil tank. Um, I've done about 100 installations in the state of Maine. I have 45 under contract right now, and I was asked on behalf of uh, a number of your residents here to come down and speak with you. And basically, if you have any questions, either during or after, uh, that's why I came. But my main concern was to address any question about these being noisy uh, apparatus. They are not. It's 55 decimals, 56 feet downwind. Uh, that's no louder than my conversation right now. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Uh, and I'll stay here until after the meeting. If anybody has any questions of me, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Wyman Briggs. I'm at Three Mountain View Road in uh, Cape Elizabeth. And though I've been active as a member of the Alternative Energy Committee, um, just speaking on my own behalf, um, I guess what's been exciting over the last year, working uh, and having had the opportunity to look at various alternative energies as, as a member of the committee, as well as being able to do it more recently as part of my work, uh, looking at uh, wind power on a more commercial basis, just to see this is a very different time we are in now than, it, than the folks in the, in the mid 80s that had the courage to be to look at wind energy as a as a exotic alternative energy. I think it's more more appropriate now to call it uh, sustainable energy or renewable energy than alternative energy. Um, particularly if you look around the world and you see the United Kingdom, for example, is in the, on the cusp of installing 6,000 windmills over the last 10 years at the order of 5 megawatts each, I mean 300 feet high offshore. And if you look at the rest of Europe and around the world, we really are behind the times. Um, even around Maine, when you, when you hear the governor looking at renewable energy to, to be part up, up to 20 percent or more of the state's electricity by 2030, the president's administration also stepping on board. I think we have to start looking at it from a whole new perspective. Obviously, with the, incre the increased price of, uh, of fuel and electricity being part of it, but looking at it not just as an esoteric type uh, thing, but as an opportunity for us to become sustainable, and uh, we need to look at it with fresh eyes. Thanks. Thank you, Wyman.
Good evening. My name is Phil Bartlett. I'm another copper bagger. I'm from Gorham, but uh, serve on the in the main side on the Utilities and Energy Committee, representing the towns of Gorham, Scarborough, Westbrook. And Council Dill suggested that I come down and offer a brief, brief perspective on what we're doing at the state level um, and how that may or may not impact your deliberations here. Uh, in the state of Maine, we've been working very aggressively at the state level to promote wind energy in Maine. Maine has one of the best wind resources in New England, uh, and there's growing demand not only in Maine, but around the region for more renewable generation. Uh, what we've been talking about a lot at the state level is sort of your grid scale uh, wind energy, like we're seeing at Mars Hill, and there are a couple other approved projects uh, at Stetson Mountain and Kibbe uh, Range as well. Uh, but we've also been talking a lot about what how we might promote uh, wind energy on a much more local level. Uh, in our committee, we've had folks come in from around the state who've had a lot of luck with wind energy. I think, as you've heard, there's a, a wide range of options available to folks, from fairly large windmills, uh, if you're in the right location, to very small, small, what we call micro turbines. There are folks who've either made their own or gotten kits to put very small wind turbines on, the, on their barns or on their garages in order to provide that steady flow. And it's typically done in coastal areas or in island areas where you have that sort of constant flow. And even a very tiny turbine can produce some significant benefit to the homeowner and have much shorter payback periods than the larger turbines that are often thought about. So I think, uh, and as part of a recent wind energy bill, we've provided some tax credits at the state level that will be coming online uh, the first of the year to provide some tax credits to folks for putting in very small scale generation at their homes and businesses. And the reason we've done that at the state level, we feel it's important to start shifting more, more away from fossil fuels. Right now, electricity, about 60% of the electricity produced in the state is from natural gas. And that's why our, high, our prices are so high. We have the highest prices, uh, New England has the highest prices in the country for electricity. So one part way to deal with that is not only grid scale wind energy, but very small scale. So the folks who are in areas where it's beneficial to them can tap into that potential, take less energy off the grid, and even possibly sell the renewable energy credits uh, to help speed up the payback period. So at the state level, we think uh, having some, uh, having develop, uh, incentivizing more small scale wind at the local level can have a tremendous impact in sort of reducing the need to build out a lot of additional power plants. With that said, we certainly understand that every municipality is different in how they deal with it. And I think for, uh, for a lot of us who've been focusing on energy, what we would like to see is, is some sort of is a balanced approach. You know, really looking at and understanding that there's a broad scale of wind power options. So that it's, uh, some people think it's, it has to be big and noisy. It doesn't. It can be very small, unobtrusive, uh, on a garage or barn that would have very little impact. So it would seem to me that as, as you think about it, and certainly the state levels we've thought about it, trying to think about it in a way of, okay, what are the decibel levels that are acceptable for what distance? What kind of buffer zones should be provided? What kind of view sheds are we really trying to protect? And really look at those things that really maximize your property values and the beauty of the area, while also giving folks some flexibility within those parameters to see if they can have a, an attractive option for wind power or solar or other similar types of energy. Take any questions? Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Tom McInerney. I live at 29 Old Fort Road. Um, I've sent an email to all of you already, and I'd just like publicly to say that I think uh, I applaud the Bothells for kind of being the leaders in this, and I think uh, this is something we should seriously take a look at. I'm sure there are lots of things we have to worry about in terms of setbacks and things like that, but um, a lot of the information here tonight uh, gives me encouragement that we are ideally suited, uh, not in my neighborhood, I don't think, but it's certainly in other neighborhoods down by um, Kettle Cove and, and such as uh, th those areas. So I would just add my voice to those that are strongly in support of using renewable energy sources uh, in this uh, difficult time. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Warren Roos. I live at uh, 36 Kettle Cove Road. And I want to share one thing I've learned with you. And that thing is that pioneers take arrows. And really, that's all I've learned in the last year. Uh, for me, the people I've met along this voyage to find out, really do diligence and find out about wind power, 
Uh, that alone, if nothing went further, it's really been great. It's really great to see the groundswell of interest, and it's also great to see how, just how smart and knowledgeable people are about this. And I wanted to publicly thank them all, uh, especially perhaps the early adopters over there with their tower. And that's where I'd like to start, is that I noticed in the uh, planning uh, committee, if that's the right term, they've recommended a monopole. Monopoles are great. They're really cool. They're also, per foot, very, very expensive. And I don't know if you could, would consider a guide tower versus a monopole, but it's certainly something I'd like to ask you to think about. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but making them up, and I bet Bob could fill me in more, uh, I think once you get in that 40, 50 foot area, it's two or three times the cost per tower. I also don't know this for a fact, but maybe Steve does. I think the guide towers could be stronger overall. Don't know. Are they? Yeah. Today, natural gas closed at $11.57. That's high. Oil today closed at $145.17 a barrel. That's high. The um, article that uh, Alan talked about, or excuse me, the town that Alan talked about is written up in the New Yorker magazine two or three weeks back. There's a whole long article on it, which I haven't read yet, but I've gotten emails about. And it, it's really fascinating. It, they went green. And that's sort of my little mini daydream. We're looking at the house to see if we can convert to LP now so that we don't burn any fossil fuels in the um, furnace. Um, really just a great big thanks to everybody who's really, edu I thought I knew stuff and boy was I educated along the way. So thank you all of you. Thanks a lot. Thanks Warren. Hi, uh, my name is Bill Slack, um, 36 Scott Dyer Road. Um, I'm also a member of the Alternative Energy Committee and I wanted to speak I wanted to give my support for both um, both ordinances. Um, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of people with passion for the um, residential windmills, and I know there's a lot of thought that needs to be um, given as to how it how it gets implemented. But I think it's a, uh, definitely is this is time to come to move forward on that. Relative to the municipal. Um, on our committee, we're looking at a number of alternatives, um, as the town had um, chartered us with, including conventional conservation as as a as a as a measure. Um, but we're looking at wind, solar, um, geothermal, um, fuel switching, uh, biomass, um, uh, cogeneration, different options that we can deploy in in the uh, municipality to. Um, um, help save energy costs and reduce our carbon footprint. Um, not, not one of these alternatives is going to be the uh, panacea and solve all our problems. Um, but clearly wind is, is, is an opportunity we want to look at. Without the ordinance, um, we can't really move forward with that. Um, as Alan mentioned, the height is important. And you know, we certainly would like to, you know, for a municipal project, um, you know, can have the opportunity to consider even taller towers than, than you've recommended to take advantage of the wind resource, best wind resource. And I thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity. Thanks, Bill. Hi, I'm Stephen Bothell, 90 Ocean House Road. Um, just a couple items. Um, I'd probably be a good idea to look again at the guide towers over the monopole towers. Um, the guide towers actually, from a distance, don't show up quite as much at the 100 foot level as a monopole tower because the guide wires give it so much more strength. Excuse me. You, you've got your pad right at the microphone. Oh, okay. uh, All right. Um, and um, the. Uh, as far as the municipal um, project, if you found that you had a site by using a wind um, survey that was real good for wind production, 
probably using a, having a 10 kilowatt unit probably wouldn't be as good as using something a little bit larger. Um, I visited quite a few of the wind sites across the state of Maine and New York over the past few years. Um, the Hull the Hull One wind project is um, I think it's a little bit over 650 kilowatt unit, and it's a 150 foot tower. And the one at the Portsmouth Abbey in Rhode Island is the same machine, same brand machine, um, and it is um, very close to the school. It's right within, I would say, less than 150, 200 feet from the from the classroom areas at the school. And the wind, the noise level is such that you and I could have a conversation at the base of the tower right now at its maximum speed, which is 20 uh, revolutions per minute, which is extremely slow compared to my machine. Um, its maximum speed is 300 RPM. Um, so if you have an idea, if you find an ideal spot for the town, I mean, a place like the transfer station where, where you've got a lot of um, exposure, where there are no um, trees, and you've got the funneling effect of where the marsh comes up through, or the school area where there's also has that same effect. Um, a larger project, a larger machine, may be a faster, um, a faster payback with, um, with more output from it. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so anyone else? I will call this. Public hearing closed. Thank you all. Uh, there Oops, there a, is one more person. Check. Sorry. Very brief. Uh, I'm Roy Craig. I uh, live next to Warren Roos. Warren has kept us fully informed on his plans. And I just want to publicly thank the council for their careful deliberation since I'm out of butter, so to speak. Thank you. Hi there, Carl Dietrich, 500 Ocean House Road. It looks like the score was about 20 to 1. If we don't do it, what would we be teaching our children? That would be my concern. If we, if we don't do it, what would we tell them? We're putting, we give everything to the children, everything for the schools. But if we don't seek this alternative or renewable, what would we, we be teaching them? When the ideal spot, um, I like the person who said, I don't think we need studies and studies and studies. I think it's the Nike thing. Let's just do it. Do it cleanly, do it right, but it's time to, to do it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. I'll ask again. <laughs> Is there anyone else? Okay. Oh, I'll declare this public hearing closed. Thank you. Um, we are, the council is going to be discussing this issue now, so those of you who are interested in windmills might, might want to stay. Um, item 96 is the windmills, and uh, we may or may not be taking votes, so just ask you to either clear the doorway or stay. Thank you. Cynthia, you're chairman of the Ordinance Committee. Would yes, you I like to start off our discussion by proposing a motion or motions? Yes, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, and I apologize for being late. I was in at an event with Senator George Mitchell, and he was just finishing up his remarks, and I felt like I needed to just stay until the end, and then I quickly split. But I apologize for being a few minutes late. Um, thank you um, for... Um, the testimony and the opportunity, Marianne, to um, present briefly the Ordinance Committee's um, work on this issue. Um, Councillor Lynch, Councillor uh, Rowe, and myself make up the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance Committee, and it was no. referred to us. Councillor. I'm sorry. Lennon. Council I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Excuse me. It's okay. Councillor Lennon. Um, okay, we're often confused. We were um, given a recommendation by the planning board um, that contained two parts. One was to um, amend our zoning ordinance to allow for residential windmills in every district, um, for the most part, on lots, minimum lot size of 20,000 square feet, 
and the only um, real uh, limitation was a, side, a height of 100 feet and um, certain setbacks. So it was very broad um, with regard to residential windmills. Every lot in every zone uh, that was at least 20,000 square feet could have a windmill up to 100 feet. And the second part of the proposal that we were asked to consider was um, that the town of Cape Elizabeth um, amend the zoning ordinance to enable the town itself to have a pilot project. And uh, with respect to the first issue, what we did, uh, we met a few times and then we also went down and um, in a site visit saw the two windmills in Saco. One's a 35-foot windmill at their public works area and the other is a 100-foot windmill at the new train station. And none of us at the time, and certainly not now, but I'm a little bit better, were our experts about um, wind towers. So I think we did the best we could under the circumstances, asked a lot of questions of the town planner and did some research. But what we ultimately decided as the ordinance committee then was to um, recommend unanimously that the zoning ordinance in the town of Cape Elizabeth be changed to um, define uh, a windmill as a municipal use and allow the town to put up a windmill through the Alternative Energy Committee um, for purposes of study and data collection so that we could m be better informed in making a decision about the second part with respect to the residential issues. So um, that was what our initial recommendation was, was to um, allow a pilot project on, on town property um, and we, we voted to, to not accept at this time the recommendation to allow residential windmills. That being said, I think, at least I speak for myself, I certainly recognize that we are in very dire uh, times with respect to energy and the need for communities to move forward for alternative and sustainable energy is very important. Um, but what it seemed uh, problematic to me that we would just uh, not be more careful in our um, zoning ordinance to as a government, allow a residential windmill on a 20,000 foot square lot, say in the middle of the universe, that would not be cost effective and not actually produce sufficient wind. So I was reluctant to, to, uh, to jump off completely and allow 100 foot residential windmills, but I certainly support the proposal for the um, pilot project. So for purposes of tonight, I'm going to make a motion um, with respect to the pilot project and talk about that. And I believe other councillors are going to address the residential um, issue. So uh, by way of background, um, that's just a brief summary. And so at this point, I would like to make a motion. But I would first please draw the council's attention to um, the material in our packets for item 96-2008, and particularly the language that um, defines municipal use and wind energy system because um, I'm going to make a motion that alters just slightly the language that was initially proposed by the Ordinance Committee and I'll explain um, my reasons for that afterwards. Um, so I would move at this time that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council amend its zoning ordinance for purposes of allowing um, a wind energy system as a municipal use. And I refer the council to the draft zoning ordinance amendment that appears in the packet, specifically amending sections 19-1-3, the definitions of municipal use and wind energy system. However, the wind energy system definition, I would change uh, slightly to simply say that a wind energy system for purposes of a municipal use would be a structure or structures that may include a wind turbine, a tower, footings, electrical infrastructure, and associated equipment and structures intended to produce electrical power primarily for on-site consumption or consumption by the municipality or town of Cape Elizabeth, period. And so I propose that we delete the remainder of that sentence that talks about adjacent lots or limiting the um, capacity of not more than 20 kilowatts. Could, could you just... Is there a second? I'll second Sorry. the motion. Thank you. Could
Could I just ask Cynthia to yeah. just repeat the change you made again? I want to yes. make sure I understood it. I will, and to, to simplify it, after the second consumption on the third line, yes. we're just going to put um, by the municipality or town of Cape Elizabeth, period. So we're essentially deleting the remainder, but the entire definition of wind energy system is proposed to be a structure or structures that may include a wind turbine, a tower, footings, electrical infrastructure, and associated equipment and structures intended to produce electrical power primarily for on-site <coughs> consumption or consumption by the town of Cape Elizabeth. Ann? Could I just ask why the change in the language? Yes. Um, when the Ordinance Committee um, decided to move forward and recommend the municipal pilot project, we essentially borrowed the definition of wind energy system that had come from the planning board. But that definition was um, constructed with residential wind turbines in mind. And so there was a limit on the capacity to 20 kilowatts. But if, in fact, we're going to have a municipal pilot project to study and observe wind conditions, it seems to me we don't want to put any limits on it. We want to have an unlimited study. And so it didn't, I didn't see the need to, to limit the capacity of the wind tower um, with respect to the municipal um, wind turbine. And, and two follow-up questions, please. Uh, there's no other changes in the other language that you're proposing for the rest of the, the ordinance? No. It's just in the definitions yes. section? Yes. Yes. And, and then, again, this is just with, with respect to the municipal pilot project. I understand. <laughs> and my um, follow-up would not be for Cynthia, but um, when it's appropriate, if I see that the town planner is here, I'd just like to hear from the town planner if she has any concerns about this change in language. I don't know if you've run this by her. I or have. Not. Yes, I have oh. talked to her, and I'm, and I'm thankful for Maureen's appearance, although I don't see her. She's oh, good. behind Jack Roberts. <laughs> um, yes, she, can, she and I did have a discussion about this. Um, and I'm certainly willing to talk more about why I think it's important, but I know we have a long agenda, so... Yeah. Why don't we open up for discussions and I can answer questions and we can. Okay. So it's been moved and seconded. It has been moved and seconded. Is there anyone else who has any questions or wants to discuss this? Michael? Yeah, I have concern with the, with the language. I, no one shared this with me beforehand. And when you say for on site consumption by the town of Cape Elizabeth, that would could generally be, be thought of applying to anything within within the town of Cape Elizabeth as opposed to the governmental body. And what I heard uh, Councillor Dill really referred to was for on-site consumption by the local government as opposed to by the town of Cape Elizabeth. That's, I thought it was to read for on-site consumption, comma, or consumption by the town of Cape Elizabeth. I mean the yes, or consumption by the town of Cape Elizabeth. That um, town of Cape Elizabeth can mean... By the town go municipal government? By the local... Cape Elizabeth government or something. Yeah. To make it, because that's what I yeah. thought I was hearing, not what the, the words came out. May I briefly respond? My intent is to, my vision is to have a town. I mean, we're going to later on talk about the school budget and, and there's concerns about, you know, how can we reduce costs? And my vision is to have potentially uh, sustainable energy in the form of wind that could be used to power the schools. The, um, the town hall and the other municipal buildings so that all of the citizens of Cape Elizabeth would benefit from the reduced dependence on oil and that we'd have um, less costs associated with. So it is any, if I need to change those words to say local government, that's, it's fine with me. Well, consumption by the local government, I think, would make it clearer than okay. just by the town of Cape Elizabeth. Yeah. David? Um, I am in support of the, um, the motion with um, one slight suggestion um, on the proposed change of wording. It, the wording proposed is on-site consumption or consumption by whatever language we're going to end up with there, by the local government. I'm concerned with the, still the, the continuing reference to on-site consumption and suggest that we take that out so that it's just to produce electrical power primarily 
uh, for consumption by the local government. Otherwise, I think when we continue to refer to on-site consumption, it still suggests that an individual property owner can erect one for on-site consumption. So, so would you change the word primarily to solely? Forget I, 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 just, I just would leave it primarily, but I would, just, I would have it say primarily for consumption by the local government. I understand. Is that a, a friendly amendment that you're suggesting? Well, that would be my suggestion to Councillor Dill. I think it's an excellent suggestion, and I accept it, thankfully. Okay. Sarah? I'm in favor of it, too, but if you say local government, does that include schools? Yes. Yeah. I, I have a question. Um, it's drafted now so that it, it would allow windmills in parks and playgrounds, among other things. Well, and I have a concern about parks and playgrounds. Other than that, I'm very supportive of it. But for instance, the, the su southern 30 acres of Fort Williams is a wildlife preserve. That's the way it's zoned. It's well, we went through this with the soccer field and everything else. It's got some special zoning, doesn't it, Maureen? The southern 30 acres of Fort Williams? It, the zoning within Fort Williams is all in accordance with the master plan. That's right, which is... Which lists... Which governs. Yes, exactly. And so I think you're left with the northern, more scenic parts of the park. Um, and playgrounds don't seem to me to be a particularly um, safe place to have a windmill. So I would just briefly um, respond. I'm not for having a windmill in a playground, but I would just note that um, the proposed amendment would include a requirement that any windmill proposed by the town would require site plan review by the planning board. Mm -hmm. And so there would still be another... I mean, if I'm imagining that the Alternative Energy Committee could come forward and say, listen, we've had um, successful pilot projects at um, Gullcrest, and we've had a successful pilot project, you know, long term, um, at um, the schools, and we believe that Fort Williams has the optimal um, location, and we'd like to study it for a year to compare. Mm -hmm. And the site plan review would still have to take place. so. That's right, but it, it takes the council, let's say they come back, I mean, it seems to me, based on what we've heard tonight, one of the most optimal places would be along the cliff walk on the southern side of the lighthouse. It's a very windy spot. Um, and if we adopt this tonight, it seems to me we've taken, with, with the word parks in it, we've taken the council out of any further deliberation about whether there should be a windmill within Fort Williams because it would go to the planning board. Um, so I would like to see us delete yeah. the word park. Yeah. No. Or, and I hate writing ordinances within a meeting, or if it were to be located in, in a park, that it would have to come back to the council. The, the, the town government may not apply for any permit to, for site plan review to the planning board without permission of the town council. Okay. That, That's already established and, policy. And I, I won't vote against it because of the parks and playgrounds, but I have a reluctance about parks and playgrounds. So, Otherwise, I think it's fine. I think we can safely take out playgrounds. Can't we agree on that? Well, and then parks, can't, isn't it easy to broaden it? I mean, if we get a bunch of windmills and we love it and suddenly someone wants in a park, can't we tweak the ordinance? Uh, I, can I respond to this? All this, this? This whole line of inquiry is interesting and certainly relevant to the windmills. However, I would just remind everybody that municipal use is a yeah. definition that's used throughout the zoning ordinance. So if we start tinkering with what constitutes oh, municipal yes. use, then mm. we have to... Yes, to thank you. Point. Good point. Yes, that was my okay. concern. So basically we're adding something to the definition of municipal use. I guess I'm satisfied that if the Council has to vote on a site plan application that covers my concern. 
That's fine. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the change in definitions to 9.1.3 um, on the municipal use and the use by a municipality. Okay, opposed zero. Okay. Now, the second proposed ordinance, which came with an endorsement by the planning board and a negative recommendation at this time from the ordinance committee. Is there a proposed motion or do we want to have some further discussion? Jim? Uh, I'd like to do both. I'd like to discuss and, and ultimately pro propose a motion, if I might. Okay. Uh, as Councillor Dill said, I serve on the uh, Ordinance Committee uh, with Councillor Dill and Councillor Lennon, and I supported the idea of the Municipal Wind Project, but not uh, at that time to allow residential windmills to move forward until after we'd heard from our Alternative Energy Committee. I felt it was important not to put the cart before the horse at that time. Uh, my trepidation uh, about going ahead with resi residential windmills at that time, again, was uh, the amount of noise which was spoken to, uh, addressed by the, uh, the manufacturer's representative tonight. Um, we went down to Saco, we visited the, the windmills down there, and even the smaller of the two units, which I would consider a residential size windmill, uh, emitted a fair amount of noise. And uh, I had some pretty serious concerns about uh, allowing those town wide. Um, I also have been concerned by reports that Saco uh, two windmills are not performing uh, anywhere near expectations. So I, at that point, I voted, as I said, with the rest of the Ordinance Committee. But since that time, I've had a chance to do a lot more research. I've, I've talked with people. I visited Warren Roos. I went back down to Saco. Uh, I've done some reading, and we've received some wonderful emails from uh, Dr. Vreeland um, on uh, his research, and, and my perspective has frankly changed. Uh, as I told my colleagues uh, on the town council a couple weeks ago. Uh, I am now also in favor of moving ahead in the residential uh, arena, albeit uh, still in a cautious manner. Um, again, because of my concern about noise, I'd be interested in talking about more restrictive conditions uh, than those that were recommended originally by the planning board. Specifically, I'd be interested in a debate on uh, expanding the minimum lot size uh, required for windmills beyond what has been recommended by the, the uh, planning board, uh, increasing the proposed setbacks from abutters, and also, I don't know if you, we can do such a thing, but looking at uh, limiting noise emissions and so forth. Um, my ultimate goal would be to reach a balance whereby we can move ahead with residential windmills, but also remain sensitive to uh, the peace and quiet in our neighborhoods. And I think, I think we can find that point if we're willing to debate and talk and, and bring in a couple experts. So my goal uh, would be to, uh, and I will make this in a motion, I would like to refer the residential windmill issue to town council workshop. I'd like to turn this around as expeditiously as we can, uh, if we can have a, uh, a workshop within the next couple weeks, three weeks, or before our August meeting, put it that way, so that we might have something to vote on at our August meeting. I'd like to turn this around uh, if, we are, if that's what we wish to do. So uh, formally, I'll make a motion that we refer uh, the residential windmill issue uh, to town council workshop. Second. Second. Okay. Is there further discussion? Cynthia? Well, I think it's a great idea. I think that um, what we got for a recommendation from the planning board um, was certainly bold. Um, it was just a little too bold, I think, for my comfort level because there weren't the kinds of restrictions that I think you find in the other uh, residential wind ordinances that are out there. I mean, there's been a reference to, um, you know, other towns. Um, we have in our packet a Wiscasset ordinance that is, has a lot of design standards and is just uh, much more detailed and comes from, I think, a reasonable uh, desire to balance both the need to explore sustainable energy with you know, respecting property owners' rights and um, being realistic about the return on investment. So I'm in support of the motion. Anne? Um, I'm also in support of the motion. I think Wind Power 
Uh, I'm very intrigued by the potential of it. Um, Jim mentioned several issues to discuss, and another issue I would like to see discussed at the workshop is this um, question of guide um, wind towers versus monopole wind towers, um, because the planning board had said monopoles, but I've heard from some folks that guide towers might be better. So that's just something to sort of add to our agenda for that workshop, please. Okay. David? Um, I also support uh, the referral of this to a workshop. We've probably heard maybe a dozen different issues raised by people, including guide versus monopole, decibel level setbacks, um, height restrictions. Um, we heard a reference to protecting view sheds, and the interesting thing with that is that perhaps some of the view sheds to be protected are some, some of the more preferred areas in which to place a wind turbine. Um, so I think there are a number of things that are best discussed in a workshop where we can have an exchange with people who are presenting to us, perhaps a little more informally than we can have here tonight. So I'm in favor of the referral. I'm also in favor of it. I'm, in, I'm actually in favor of <clears throat> the whole concept. Largely, I too was resistant to it, or very nervous about it after we visited SACO. And like uh, Councilor Rowe, I've changed my mind mostly because of the huge outpouring of enthusiasm from the people in the town. Um, articles, emails, phone calls, visits, and then just the showing tonight has essentially completely changed my mind. So I just wanted to express appreciation for everybody out there who's pushing forward alternative energy. And I, I would uh, echo Sarah. Um, I support having this go to a workshop because I think it's very difficult to draft an ordinance on the fly. If windmills are going to work, they're going to work because we craft a thoughtful ordinance that works not just for the windmill owner but also for the abutters. So um, I'm very favorably disposed based on everything I've heard and everything I've learned in recent weeks. I just want to make personally make sure that the council gets it right so that we have an ordinance that really does work for uh, the town as a whole the windmill users and the abutters. So um, I think it's a great idea, Jim. Thank you to go to workshop. Uh, and it seems to me we ought to be able to workshop this and have it back on our agenda for the August meeting so that um, I, I know people get impatient with the pace of government, um, but I think we can do this rather quickly, and, but do it right. So. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor of scheduling a workshop and um, I guess uh, putting this back on our August agenda, that would be six in favor. Thank you. Thank you all who came out tonight. I um, appreciate that. And the next item on our agenda is a public hearing on the proposed 2009 school budget. And I will open up the public hearing just as soon as we get the room. OK, is there anyone who would like to um, speak on the school budget? Hi, Tara Bucci for Kettle Cove Road, Cape Elizabeth. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Pond Cove Elementary. And I just wanted to um, tell you about the teacher appreciation for the support you've been showing for our schools and the students and the staff. I was going to speak earlier about the windmills because I'm teaching about renewable energy and resources in the classroom. And we relate back to Bethel's windmill all the time in the classroom. I'm expressing that. And it's great to see that you're moving forward in the future of our children and in the environment. And I just wanted to thank you for your support for our schools and the teachers and the children. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on the school budget? Uh, my name is David Hillman, 22 Cranbrook Drive in Cape Elizabeth. Um, 
I obviously support the 6% that was informally voted on by the school, excuse me, the town council uh, some time ago. Um, I just want to share with you two thoughts that I've had based on my experience in actually working on behalf of the group called CAPE. Um, I canvassed two neighborhoods, one what we what would call an upper income neighborhood and one deliberately a lower to moderate income neighborhood. And I spent probably five days going door to door, literally hundreds of doors, and probably called two to three hundred people, um, obviously trying to support schools. And I found something that I suspected all along, that what people think of as school supporters has been, quite frankly, too narrow. And uh, people tend to think, uh, some people tend to think that school supporters are people with kids in the schools. And I found uh, anecdotally in my, in my uh, travels that that simply was not true. That when I went door to door, that I would say about 80% of the people with children in the school supported the 6%, but not, not 100%. I found the lowest number of supporters, but still a majority, was among people with no children. I found a very high level of support, probably roughly 70%. I understand this is not scientific, it's my own rough numbers, were elderly. And what I heard from some of the elderly people was astonishing. I got my start, I got ahead in life through education, and I've always supported education, I always will support education. It was a frame I heard consistently from the elderly, which I found very heartening. And then I sort of analyzed roughly the numbers that came in. There was about 638 two lows. We have about, I've been told, and I obviously don't know this, about seven to 800 families with children in schools. Uh, a significant portion of that is our single parents. So if you assume 700 families, two parents, that's 1,400 votes. If you assume only about 80% of them supported it, that would make it about 1,100 votes. Um, and if you assumed that we had a 40% turnout, if you assumed that 50% more people with children in school went out and voted, so you had a 60% turnout of that 1,100, that's about 600 votes. There was 1,600 voting too low, meaning they wanted more money for the schools. That tells me um, fairly forcefully that school supporters' definition should be changed, or at least conceptually thought of as being very broad-based, elderly, people without children, people with children, people of moderate income, people of upper income. CAPE has shown across the board that its school supporters are not pigeonholed by their age, by their income, by whether they have kids or not. And I think that's two good lessons, very heartening lessons I got from this. And I just want to share with you those, my, my thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you, David. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on the school budget? Warren Roos, 36 Kettle Cove Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine, 04107. In 1983, my wife Helen and I thought about starting a family. And at that time, we called up people we knew in Cape Elizabeth, Falmouth, Cumberland, Freeport, Kennebunk, and all over. And you can probably guess what I'm going to say. Can you guess? We wanted to know about the schools because that's where we wanted to live and start a family. That was our chief concern and at that time Cape Elizabeth was everybody's darling, best schools, devoted, great, terrific. So that's why we moved here, just for that. And when I make a mental image of this town, I think about the strawberry fields, I think about Fort Williams, I think about, I don't know why, I think about Casino Beach because I like the old pictures of Casino Beach. I think about that it used to be the lettuce growing capital of New England. And I think about the schools, and that's sort of my mental image. And I also think about the Portland Press Herald always slamming Cape Elizabeth, and I don't like that either. But that's what I think of. Events, time, budgets, needs have changed things. And my view of our town has changed. I love living here. I couldn't think of living anywhere else except maybe Hawaii, but that's not going to happen. But what has changed, and what is obvious that I'm going to say, is that I do not think we are the preeminent schools anymore. I'm pretty sure that there are figures that can tell you that in Freeport they spend X per child, and in Cape we spend Y per child. Don't know. 
I'd say give the schools everything. Give them exactly what they want because that's our future. That's a large proponent of what makes up, or excuse me, component of what makes up this town. There are creative ways to do it. There could be tipping fees. There could be a bus fees for the park. There could be taxes, which are, of course, a big rub. They're going to have to be. But I encourage you guys to give the schools everything. I encourage you to do a workshop and ask the principals what they need and give it to them because that is our town, and that's what's going to attract younger people to keep coming into this town, and we need to do that. So go schools, give them everything they want, because I want it to be 1983 again. Thanks. <laughs> We'd all like it to be 1983. I'd like to be that young again. Thank you, Warren. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to the school budget? I'm Tom Dunham. I, we live at uh, 12 Becky's Cove. And, um, you know, if, uh, what I'm concerned about is the uh, increase this year. We're more concerned about what, what's it going to be next year and the year after. And at some point, you're just going to drive people out of town. And I'm very concerned about it. I'm very concerned about people on uh, limited incomes that are retired here. And <clears throat> if uh, this year has sets a precedent, precedence for the uh, forthcoming years, we're going to have a major issue because you're going to drive people out of town. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Is there anyone else? Okay. I will close the public hearing. And uh, I will look for a motion. David. Well, I'm not quite sure what the most efficient way is to make this, so I'll try and make it short with everything we've got here. Um, I would suggest that the date of the election, which may be the only, is the word uncontrovertible, <laughs> be separated out from whatever other motion you make. My point well, being, I think there are that the date is going, everyone will vote for that. And I'm not sure about the rest. OK. Um, and our date is uh, June, July 24? July 22nd. July 22nd, <laughs> thank you. Well, I wasn't prepared to go to the date. I was going to go to other things. OK, July 22nd. Well, um, included in Well, that. in that case, I move that um, we set a school budget validation referendum uh, for public vote on Tuesday, July 22, 2008 for the purpose of giving voters an opportunity to vote yes or no on the question of whether or not they favor approving the school budget for the upcoming year as approved by the town council at this evening's meeting. Is there, is there discussion? Well, I just want to, may I? Yes. I, I, so we're voting to have the referendum election on the 22nd, but we haven't yet had a vote on the percentage increase. Is that correct? That is correct. That's correct. We'll just get this out of the way. So no further discussion. All in favor? Just. Procedurally, if I may, Madam Chair, what you're doing is that you're approving the last paragraph in the draft motion. That's right. That's right. And that's uh, all in favor? I wasn't even Page looking five. at the draft motion. Okay. Okay, so that is 6 0. Now we can go to the other paragraphs, which we may be able to take at one time if we have a motion to take them all together. The entire budget? Yes. Well, we have to vote on eight different items, but they're all school budget items. And my suggestion is that we have a vote to take them all together. Cynthia? Well. Um, 
Assuming that the language that's presented in the packet on pages one through five reflects an increase in the school budget of 6%, then I move that um, we adopt um, the language set forth therein. Okay. Second. Don't need a motion. No, it's fine. Okay. Great. Discussion? It's been moved and seconded. Well, I Cynthia? Just wanna, I just want to, <laughs> I didn't confirm that those numbers, in fact, reflect a 6% increase. So can I have some representation from somebody with knowledge that, in fact, they do? Yes, yes, they do. I Thank worked you. with <laughs> Paulina Portria in reviewing these and, yes. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Discussion? Jim? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I'll just reiterate my stance that I've, I've given on previous meetings. Uh, my issue is not with the school budget per se. Um, I am very much uh, for our kids, for our schools. My issue, rather, comes from an analysis of the bottom line impact on our taxpayers. I think uh, a 6.6 percent property tax increase is outrageous in this economy. Um, I have heard uh, from several citizens over the last couple of weeks, uh, many who have not shared their thoughts with the entire council, uh, but many who have uh, applauded me for holding my, holding, sticking to my uh, beliefs and their beliefs. And uh, I, I won't abandon those people. I may be in the minority opinion on this town council, uh, but I will not uh, shy from representing uh, that constituency. Cynthia? Um, yeah, I would just like to say that um, I don't, because of the state law that we're dealing with, which imposes upon us the, the requirement to have a budget referendum, um, my feeling is at this point it's all about process and that I felt my vote for a 4.6 percent increase was a reasonable compromise and carefully balanced the needs of the schools with the needs of the taxpayers, but that got voted down. And so at this point I feel that the process should be for uh, the budget to reflect the 6 percent increase and that all voters, again, will have the opportunity to come out and vote one way or the other. And so I just want to make it clear that um, I, I, I have concerns about the tax burden of our, of our citizens, but this, the outcome is essentially in their hands. And so they'll have the opportunity to vote um, on July 22nd. And I encourage them to do that. Further discussion? David? I agree. Um, entirely with what uh, Councillor Dill just said. Um, I think in light of the last, the results of the last referendum vote, um, we have an obligation to put out 6% uh, for voter approval or rejection. Um, and I'm prepared to do that. Um, the other, you know, just one other comment that I'd like to make in response to what we just heard during the public comment session. And that is this, it's a notion that really bothers me, and it's this notion that there are school supporters and that there are non-school supporters, and that if you don't support 6%, that you're not a school supporter. And nothing could be farther from the truth. And I think that it's a terribly divisive approach to take to this discussion to suggest that if you don't support 6%, and if you're not willing to give the school board everything they recommend, that somehow you are not a school supporter. And that is simply not the case. Um, no matter how elderly you are, no matter how poor you may be, no matter how wealthy you may be, everybody supports the schools. It's not an issue of 4.6% being anti-school. It's an $800 plus thousand dollar increase over last year's spending. Um, the school budget is not being cut. And I think it's important to recognize that those who suggest that there should be some form of reasonable spending restraint still support the schools. And I think the conversation will be moved along much more congenially and collaboratively in future years if there is this community-wide recognition that we all support the schools. I moved here because of the schools 11 years ago. Most of us, if not all of us, who have kids moved here at least in part because of the schools. We all want great education for our children. Um, I didn't support the 6% budget originally, and I certainly don't consider myself 
anti-education or anti-school in any sense. So that's probably far more than I should have said, but I think it's an important point to make. I feel very strongly about it, and it's the last time I want to hear somebody suggest that if you don't support what the school board requests, that somehow you are, you are not supporting and not willing to support the school systems in Cape Elizabeth, because I know I support them, and I know everybody on this town council does, and I know that a lot of the emails that I get from people who say, what are you nuts with 6%? I support the schools I always have, but there's got to be some restraint on spending. And that is a prevailing sentiment in town. Thank you. Thank you, David. Further discussion? Sarah? Sorry, I just want to quickly, briefly counter by saying the opposite is also true, that the people who support 6%, I think, grow weary of being categorized as people who do not exercise any spending restraint. In fact, a lot of people in town that talk to me say that they feel 6% is, is spending restraint and that they, if they had their druthers, like Warren Ruth, would throw everything at the school. So I think we're saying the same thing, but basically we're trying to say both sides stop calling the other side something that they're not. The 6% people also favor spending restraint. They feel that this is well within the realm of spending restraint, and they feel that the 6% is necessary to make up for past years when they felt there was a, a too much excessive spending restraint. So just to clarify that, it's not those of us who favor 6% are not, you know, big spender. We want to tax everybody out of their houses. Ann? I'd like to echo what Councillor Backer said. Um, what, we are, what we have been discussing all along this whole budget season, which seems to have stretched out interminably, is how much of an increase. I mean, not one person on this council or on the staff that I know of um, has talked about decreasing the school budget or cutting the school budget. So it's all about how much of an increase, and reasonable people can disagree about how much of an increase. Councillor Rowe and I started out amongst these seven folks on the low end. Um, I do think uh, that when we were at 4.3%, um, I do think that uh, given the information that w there was enough information before the June vote, and there was enough of a turnout that, for me, it was a sufficient mandate to put the 6% school board budget before the public again for a referendum. It is not that I have abandoned my fiscal uh, restraint, my, my restrained ways, but um, I think the rejection of the 46 increase of a school board uh, school budget referendum on June 10th uh, made it clear that a lot of Cape citizens are willing to see their property taxes rise by 6.6 percent in the middle of a recession and even with declining school enrollment so this time we should be willing to give those folks a chance to vote on the school board's six percent increased budget I do like Councillor Dill and everyone, everyone up here encourage people to vote. I anticipate turnout will be low because it's you know an unusual time of the year to be having a vote. Um, I would offer one um, clarification of Mr. Hillman's facts, which is the one I checked with the school um, department last year when I was gathering some information. There were slightly more than 1,000 households, 1,000 families, not 600 or so in the um, who had kids in the school system. So that was the number they gave me. So perhaps, perhaps we need to update our numbers because both of those can't be correct. Thank you. I'm sorry, then I misheard. But even so, I think uh, that could be quite a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll be voting tonight for the 6% school budget increase, um, not because I think it's the number that we need to um, run the schools, but um, because, like my fellow counselors, I believe it appears that this is the number that the majority of people want to vote on, notwithstanding that it will increase taxes by 6.6%. Um, I continue to believe that it's more than we need. Um, we have steeply declining enrollments. 
um, second in comparison to what other towns are doing um, in terms of school budget increases. It's um, a staggeringly high increase. Falmouth has increased their budget by 3.5%. South Portland by 2.28%. Wyndham by 2.5%. Yarmouth by 3.8%. Portland by 4.5%. Gorham by 3.1%. Only Scarborough, which has far greater enrollment increases, is increasing their budget by 4.8%. So the um, number that the town council had come up with, at the 4.6, was really a compromise. And that, for me, is what's most troubling about um, the 6% number. Um, I, I think there truly is a value in compromise. Obviously, in a democratic society, the majority will trump. Um, and so that's why I will vote to put the 6% out. But I think the 4.6%, which is larger than all of the towns that I just um, read to you, um, did recognize the importance that we, we hold our schools in. And, and like David and Anne and Cynthia and Sarah and Jim, um, I also moved here in 1984 because of the schools. And I think that 4.6% which is greater than all of the other towns, recognized the importance of the schools. Um, but it also recognized the 20 plus percent of the town that qualifies for the circuit breaker program. So I'm truly, truly troubled that um, somehow in this town, somewhere along the line, we have, uh, it appears to have lost the ability to compromise and to recognize a compromise that tries to give value to um, both the schools and to the um, troubles that people are facing. Um, I, I went into, um, I, I'll, excuse me if I get emotional over this, but I went into um, one of the local farm markets last week and someone who worked there told me that um, one of the customers came in and said that her food budget is $15 a week. And I just about wanted to cry because we've heard a lot of comments over the previous months that $60 is nothing, that $200 is nothing. And it, I mean, it quickly became very apparent that $60 is that woman's food budget for a month. So um, that's why it's troubling to me. It's not because I'm anti-school. I am very much pro-school. But I am also very concerned about how people in this town and in this state are going to heat their homes this winter. We have an absolute catastrophe ahead of us. I'm absolutely convinced about that. And um, so I am just very troubled where we are. But I will vote for the 6% because I do respect the majority vote. Um, but I would, I would just uh, encourage everyone to vote on July 22nd or starting tomorrow morning by absentee ballot. So all in favor of the motion? One, two, three, four, five. Opposed? Show that to be Councillor Rowe opposed. Thank you. Okay. Next item on our agenda is item 98, um, the efficiency main grant application. Don't we have the government time budget? Or we've already done that? You've already you just we've done that whole vote. The town and the bond and the whole thing. And we'll just wait for the room to clear a minute for those who may be watching at home. Continue. Okay. Oh, which one we later on? Would the counselors like to take a break for a couple minutes? I'm okay. Let's like, crank it out. I could, I just need I could use two minutes to okay. stand up. I think we've probably got another hour's worth of work ahead of us at least. So I, let's take a two-minute break. Thank you. I just need to stand up. And, uh, <laughs>
update the efficiency main grant application. Um, Michael, is there anything you want to? No, it's, I think it's self-explanatory. This grant application came from the Alternative Energy Committee. We received it the, about a, with a week left in the month of June. The deadline was uh, July 1. The chairman and uh, myself signed it on the on the basis that uh, it would be reviewed this evening. Uh, it would provide for the installation of a 100-foot tower and an anemometer to measure wind conditions of the school property. The way this program works is they pay for the installation of the tower and the wind anemometer, and then they hope to reuse the tower to eventually put in a wind, wind turbine at the top of it. Okay. Matt, is there a motion? Sorry. Um, yes, I'd like to authorize the town manager and the town council chair to sign this grant application. Second. Or to approve our. Uh, uh, bless, bless your signature. Having yes, signed, bless our signature. Having signed it. But I do have one question. Yes. For the manager. So and there's a second. There's been a motion and a second. Thank you. Questions for Michael? Um, yes. And Mike, it may, I may have missed it in here somewhere, but for, if we do get this grant, does this project have to go to the planning board? You know, if they're going to put this thing up? It, it depends on uh, what else ordinances that you're approving, and uh, I think you just approved one this evening that would require a site plan of re uh, review for an actual wind turbine. Um, I'm unsure if this particular tower, since it isn't going to have a wind turbine yet, falls within that. That's something I'm going to have to show Bruce the language and have him make that determination. So you're not sure at this point, but it seems like probably? You know, it's 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 uh, it's an interesting question because it's not yet a wind turbine. It's a it's, it's a hundred foot a tower and an device. anemometer. Hmm? It's a measuring device, but it is a structure, so that's it's why a, I wondered. It's a structure, and that will go back to you know Bruce will have to take a look at it. It, it seems to me it's a structure, so it would probably have yeah. to. Sarah, um, sorry, I missed the beginning of the question because I was gone, but I think I might be able to answer it. It's Essentially, any way you can get it up 100 feet. So if you're creative and you want to put it on top of a building and it can be a skinny little pole because it doesn't obviously have to carry the weight and the force of something going around. It's just a teeny little measurement system. So I think they're going to get it up there in the easiest way they can. It's not going to be like a huge, big, ugly pole. Oh, no, I'm not worried about that. I just didn't know if it had to go through site plan review by the planning board just since it's a, it is a structure. And like when somebody builds a deck, they have to... Uh, get permits you should, and stuff, so I didn't know. I mean, it, they don't have to say to anything. It, it's up to Bruce to, to make that definition, but Thank generally you. any new structure on the school uh, property requires uh, site plan review, but there are also specific provisions already in the ordinance for towers, and in those ones would carry, and whatever those ones say is, is what we'll need to do. Well, we'll say we will do what we need to do to be consistent with our own ordinances. Okay. Yeah. Further discussion? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, zero. Thank you. The next item is item 99, um, which is the hydrogen vehicle demonstration. And uh, the town has been um, requested by Maine Clean Communities and the Hydrogen Energy Center to have a demonstration of hydrogen vehicles at Fort Williams Park on Monday, August 11th. 2008 and possibly some activities on Sunday, August 10th as well. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? That would be 6-0. Thank you. Okay, item 100, Fort Williams Park Arboretum demonstration site. Michael, do you want to speak to this? Uh, yes, uh, this comes from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. I noticed the chairman is here and other representatives of this project that can explain to you uh, the proposed arboretum, and so you get a sense of uh, what the proposal is. Okay. Do you need a motion? Oh. No, we're going, we'll hear from them first, and then we'll have a motion. Thank you. Just, I would like to explain. This is an, in, although this is coming now as a recommendation from the committee, it is an independent. When you hear a committee reference, the ad hoc committee on the Fort Williams Arboretum, if you should hear that, that is independent of the town and is not a town committee, but a group of citizens of Cape Elizabeth and the area who wish to have this happen. And this is 50% of the ad hoc committee. <laughs> um, other people are on vacation. I'm Kathy Bacasto, and I grew up in Cape Elizabeth, 
and don't live in Cape Elizabeth now, but my heart is in Cape Elizabeth as it has been uh, since I came here. And John Mitchell, you probably all know. Um, the other two members of our ad hoc committee are Rick Churchill and Chris Murray. And this is, I'm not sure how much detail you want. Um, I, I know that you've had a chance, hopefully, to look at the presentation that we put together. And it's something that came out of a conversation that I had with Joel Russ and Rick Churchill about a year and a half ago. And we got this notion of what could we do to make sure that Fort Williams was preserved, that the beauty was there, that it didn't get taken over by invasive plants, that it was something that could be in, enjoyed by everybody in the community for years and years to come. And we started thinking about the notion of trying to create pockets of planned plantings around the fort, do our best to um, make sure that the invasive plants were kept at bay, and um, provide some knowledge, education, and kind of uh, order to the horticulture at Fort Williams. And so the four of us, well, it's been kind of an, an in and out group, but at this point, we are the four. And we walked around the fort and we identified um, potentially 14 or 15 sites that could be considered around the perimeter primarily um, to be planted over time. Uh, we have been working closely with the advisory commission, have presented our ideas a couple of um, times. And most recently, John did a design um, which would be a demonstration site that we would propose um, to do, um, which sits at the back entrance to the cliff walk. And it would be um, an opportunity to see if this really could work um, to improve the tangle of bittersweet and black swallow warts and all other nasty invasives that have made their way and perhaps open up the view a little bit and put plants there, trees that would be um, both beautiful and educational. They'd be sustainable, native plants primarily, um, and we would go from there, presuming that that worked, um, then hope that we could make our way as funds permitted. We also see this as a, as a rallying point, really, for fundraising. It could help the whole cause at the fort because it would give people a purpose in addition to the historical and um, other benefits that are there. And I guess that's it. John, do you have anything you want to add? Well, um, I'll just very briefly, quickly go through the, the design of um, the initial phase. This initial phase is um, is just the, the first phase of a much larger arboretum concept. And if you look at the uh, the first graphic in your packet um, that identifies what what we did, as Kathy mentioned, we went around the fort. We identified 15 different locations, uh, primarily around the perimeter of the fort, um, that would lend itself to, uh, you know, plant collections. And this one is um, area B. B? Uh, area B. B. Okay. Yep. On the overall master plan. Um, and we, we uh, selected this area primarily because of its visibility, exposure, um, as well as this is an area that is really just uh, over, been overtaken by uh, invasive plants, and it would be great to clean it up. Um, just to orient you with this location, this is the primary access drive coming into the fort from, um, from Shore Road. This is the parade ground here, parking spaces. Um, Battery Hobart is, is located here. So this area would extend from the access drive uh, towards the water to the to the cliff walk. <clears throat> um, it's about it's a little over an acre in size. Um, the entrance or the ori what I'm calling the orientation would be located here, uh, which would be in clear view of the parking. So if if there are any visitors coming to the fort to visit the arboretum, uh, presumably they would park here and just walk across uh, the access drive up onto the existing sidewalk 
um, to the entrance to the Arboretum. And then from there, it's, it's basically what you see here are, you know, this is, this is really conceptual. Uh, but what you see is a series of curvilinear walkways that would form spaces for plant collections or open lawn areas that would be surrounded by um, plantings. And um, I guess the, the focal point of this arboretum is what we're calling the overlook area, uh, which would be um, closest to the water, overlooking um, or be adjacent to the cliff walk and would contain more of a formal arrangement of plants. Uh, we, have, uh, we have talked about uh, phasing this initial area into phase one and phase two, and phase one would consist of phase 1A and 1B. Um, and obviously as funds become available, we'll be able to expand um, more, you know, uh, into future phases. Um, Let's be happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes. Sarah? You know that green grass where people fly kites? That's here. So that stays? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that stays. This, this area is, is, right now, it's entirely wooded. Uh, there are some deciduous trees, but it's mostly invasive plants, bittersweet. And sumac. Sumac. It's a lot of, a lot of uh, junk, well, junk plants, black swallow. Yeah, black it's, it's a jungle. I mean, you yeah, can't, you can't a, even walk in the area. Uh, Cynthia, Jim. You have a question. I was going to make a motion. Well, let's have a motion first, so I would move we'll that focus our discussion. Okay, I move that we um, authorize the town manager to file an application to the planning board for site plan review of the proposed arboretum at Fort Williams Park as described in the memorandum dated July 14, 2008 from the independent ad hoc arboretum at Fort Williams Park Committee. Second. Okay, now discussion. Jim? Yeah, I just had one question. Uh, how come I look 25 years older than my classmate, Kathy Backestow? <laughs> 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 no, I'm, I'm really excited by this project, and I was thrilled. I'm a good friend of John Mitchell's, and uh, he told me about it uh, months ago, and uh, really excited uh, that this is going forward. And thanks for your participation, Kathy. And you haven't given away all my secrets, have you? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, you he's only 39. <laughs> I, I wanted to make a quick comment about John Mitchell. Back in the mid-1970s, the town council formed a committee. George Terrian was on it, Paula Alkin, Steve Simons, uh, Bob Masterton, and maybe there was one other person. Uh, and that committee, at the, at the time, the fort was a mess. It, it really needed a lot of work. The, where the entrance road now is, where the, the entrance field now is, there was an old road that went straight in at the bottom of the, the hill, and there were all sorts of dilapidated buildings. And they worked with a young architect, landscape architect named John Mitchell. And it was John that really designed the basic element of what Fort Williams is today. The, the new entrance road, closing off all the other roads in the park. And he was the one that, there were a few ideas, and he was the one that committed it to paper. So, you know, he's sort of the, uh, the Olmstead of, of uh, Fort Williams Park. <laughs> And, uh, well, he, you know, he doesn't always take credit for it, but particularly, I, I like every five years or so, I like to remind folks of that because uh, what we have there, you know, there were a lot of citizens involved over, over the years, but, but it was John Mitchell that, that put the plan on paper that, that really made it finally happen, that it began to become a park and something that the community could be proud of. So another good opportunity to thank John Mitchell. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, Sarah? Oh, so I just have a really quick question. Who's going to actually do the work? Like put the plants in the ground? Are you going to subcontract it all? Well, we have a budget that includes um, that. So we, we've talked um, and have had involvement from Southern Maine Community College. Perhaps students could do it as part of a work study program. Um, I'm a master gardener. I, 
expect we could use Master Gardener resources, but our presumption is that we would have to pay for everything. Um, but hope that we could get volunteers mm -hmm. to do a lot of the work and have more money for plants. Great. Other discussion? Anne? It, it's not so much discuss discussion, but I, I assume in terms of the fundraising for this that you'll be working with the Fort Williams found, uh, Charitable Foundation? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Thank you very much for your work. It's yes. very exciting. Thank you all. Very cool. Okay. We are at um, item 101, which is the Shore Road Pathway Committee update. There is an update um, contained in our package. I don't know if there's anyone here to speak on it, so no. um, we're just looking to acknowledge receipt of the update from the Shore Road Pathway Committee. Yeah. Maureen could ask any questions if there are any. And Maureen can answer any questions if anyone has any. Cynthia? Well, I'm, I have the pleasure of serving on the Shore Road Path Committee, and I'm going to assume that my fellow counselors have read the very detailed report that was prepared by our staff person, Maureen, and I would move that we acknowledge receipt of the Shore Road Path Committee update report that Second. is contained in our packet. Sorry. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second, and I would just like to add that that committee has already done a tremendous amount of work. Um, it's well represented with um, residents of Shore Road on both sides of the road. Um, and uh, they're working very hard. I know they anticipate um, meeting with any and all Shore Road residents in the months ahead. So I just want to again thank them for all of their work to date. So with that, we will move, we will vote on accepting the report. And it is 6-0. Nice to have these non-controversial items. And the next item is our comprehensive plan update. And uh, there was a lot of material in our package which contained the state of Maine comments on our um, comprehensive plan. And the town planner has recommended that we schedule a public hearing um, only on the proposed amendments to the plan, which are all fairly minor if you've had a chance to look through your package. So, um, Anne, is there a motion? Yes, I would move that we set a public hearing, we schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to the plan as described in the memo dated June 26, 2008 from Maureen O'Meara. The uh, public hearing would be scheduled for Monday, August 11th at 7.30 p.m. Second the motion. Second, okay. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? A six zero. Thank you. On the next item is item 103. It is the Trout Brook Watershed Community Fee Utilization Plan. Um, is there any discussion from the manager? I would recommend you handle this one with the same dispatch you handled the previous one. Okay. <laughs> um, and I uh, trust that you have all um, read that and uh, the Department of Environmental Protection. You may recall that we voted on a community fee utilization plan um, a few months ago, and the DEP, the state DEP, has come back with some comments. So um, the planner has recommended that we amend our fee utilization plan as described in her memo, which was in our package. And I would move that we so amend it. <laughs> Second. Discussion? Well, Sarah. Can I talk to Maureen? You, yes, One Maureen, minute. come. Well, well, let's wait for Maureen to get up so that <laughs> the people that are watching at home can follow. Maureen, can you just, in a very gestalt, less than one minute way, summarize? the amendments and changes and if you think they're a good thing and why. When you collect the money, you have to identify projects that you're going to spend the money on and the DEP wanted to be much more detailed in the type of project description. Same projects, it's just a lot more information on exactly how you're going to do those projects. 
So it's not, there's not a major shift in focus or change. It's, it's essentially sharpening what's already there. For example, a major project was restoring riparian buffers, restoring the native vegetation, vegetation adjacent to Trout Brook. We said we wanted to do it. And what the DEP did is identified 50 locations with GPS coordinates and specifics about exactly what was growing there and that shouldn't be cut anymore. Same idea. It's just a lot more detail. And Maureen, you did provide that detail yeah. in our package. I thank you for all of that. Sorry, one more information. It seemed like the, the issues they had with where the roadway comes to the water and the runoff, and it sounded like those projects that they were t recommending were just too vast in scale and too expensive, and so that's kind of going to be a non issue. Well, they're at the end of the list. The list is in an order of priority, and if we end up collecting, you know, one and a half million dollars in CFUP funds, then we can knock off one of those road projects. But the expectation is we will never collect that amount of money. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Two, three, four, five, six, zero. And the next item is item 104, which is the um, renaming of the Cape Elizabeth um, High School track and field, the one in front of the high school, the Keith R. Weatherby track and field. This was unanimously recommended um, by the school board. Um, they voted at their June 10th meeting. I do see the principal here, um, if you would like to share any further information. We are all familiar with Keith's long and illustrious and, and I was career. only here as if, if anybody has any questions. Um, I submitted the memo at the same time to Alan Hawkins and to Mike McGovern and I assume it's that in our package. familiar with it. So I'm here if there are any questions uh, that you'd like to hear about. Okay. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Sure. Are there any questions for Jeff? No? Is there a motion? David. I move that we accept the school board's unanimous recommendation uh, to name the track and field in front of the Cape Elizabeth High School as the Keith R. Weatherby track and field. Second. All in favor? That would be 6-0. Please let Keith know that it was also unanimous by the town council. So some way we could get his nickname put on there too, Catfish? That was, Catfish? That was his <laughs> <laughs> that was his nickname. In high that school. wasn't in the package. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Insider information. Jim, I'm glad I didn't go to high school with you. Between yeah. divulging the last person's age and now Keith Weatherby's nickname. Tell everything you know. Okay. The next item is item 105. It is a request from. Um, Cross Hill LLC to discontinue um, the unbuilt portion of Tiger Lily Lane. The town has um, a legal interest. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's an easement or a fee. There seems to be a little question mark, but we do have some legal property interest in that um, portion of Tiger Lily Lane. And so before us is this request to discontinue it. The manager had an initially recommended a public hearing because he thought if we were planning to discontinue the town's legal interest that we ought to have a public hearing if we were planning on discontinuing it. Um, uh, he's here and he can speak for himself, but he, he has told me that he does not feel a public hearing is in order if we are not planning to discontinue it. And I see three members of um, the Jordan, uh, the abutters, three abutters um, here, and I know they would like to speak to this item. So one or more of them would like to speak to this. And thank you for your patience. It's been a long meeting. I'm Penny Jordan, the official spokesperson for the Jordan family. So it, it, it was, uh, I guess, passed down to me from my father because he initially was the official spokesperson. Um, I am a Penny Jordan property owner, business owner of, on Wells Road. And um, I think 
a few of you, uh, and I, I assume once emails go out to a couple of people, they go to everybody. So uh, received an email from um, my family over the weekend. Um, basically, what I wanted to say here today is that um, as Cross Hill was under development, Tiger Lily Lane, it was always stated uh, to us uh, by our father that that was an important connector to our back property. And uh, we have an entrance from Deer Run Road, and uh, we want to maintain uh, the opportunity to have access off uh, Tiger Lily Lane for uh, approximately over 70 acres of our property. Um, in addition, he always stated that at some point the town may want to connect Sawyer Road to Spring Avenue. And so we have this uh, um, vision that uh, someday we might have to take that opportunity. But um, basically what we're saying at this point in time is that the uh, Tiger Lily Lane, as it was laid out on the original plan, should stay in place. Um, basically because easements and right-of-ways and all of those things are put in place for a reason because we never know what the future is going to bring. And we were always taught, keep your options open. And the um, access uh, through Tiger Lily Lane uh, maintains options for us and for our property. We never know when we might have to access that property in order to keep uh, the farm operation going. Um, we also know that there are uh, other descendants of uh, Bill Jordan who may want to build on that property someday. And we want to be able to um, allow that to happen in line with zoning ordinances that exist in the town. So Tiger Lily Lane um, really is an important access for our property and we are opposed to the discontinuance of that. And we want to maintain the plan as it was initially laid out when Cross Hill was initially developed. Thank you, Penny. Cynthia? Um, well, I'll make a motion that we indefinitely postpone the request um, by Cross Hill LLC, as it appears in our packet as item 105-2008. Is there a second? second? OK, all in favor? Wait, sorry, can I ask a question? Not what does that mean? It's not debatable. That oh, I can't ask a question. It's not debatable, no. I don't know what it means. It definitely postponed. It means it's dead. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> One, two, three, I'm sorry. Okay. four, five, six. Six zero. Okay. And uh, I, I will just say for the benefit of the public, it wasn't debatable, but I think most of us feel that the town um, had acquired <coughs> those rights in a very um, long and comprehensive planning process, and I think us, I'll take the liberty of speaking for most of us, feel that we should not be giving away rights that the town has without some benefit, uh, some bu public benefit to the town. Um, so in addition to what's been said here tonight by private parties, um, I think it's fair to say that um, most of us, if not all of us, feel very strongly that um, there ought to be a public benefit to any kind of discontinuance. Just, I would mention, you mentioned the three Jordans, Pam Butterfield. Am I missing? Uh, Pam I'm sorry. Jordan Butterfield also. <laughs> okay. no, she wasn't here when you said it, but the whole family's here now, the okay. whole generation. Great. I've lost my agenda. Does that mean that we can go <laughs> We're home? We're not done. I, <laughs> no. Three more pages. We're on the Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Um, the next item on our agenda is item 106. Um, and it is proposed amendments to miscellaneous offenses ordinances. I will let the planner speak to everything except the last sentence. Um, as many of you know, I walk through Fort Williams every day, and I'm always struck we have a carry-in, carry-out for trash. I'm always struck, though, uh, uh, at the number of people who hop out of their cars and smoke a cigarette and put their cigarettes out at the beginning of the southern part of the cliff walk. It's a popular smoking area by the lighthouse. And um, so I'm motivated more by solid waste issues um, when I asked the manager to put into our package a proposal to ban smoking in Fort Williams. Uh, but nobody seems to think that they smoke a cigarette and should put the butt in their pocket. 
pocket. So um, that's my introduction to my proposed ban on smoking in Fort Williams, and it is proposed that that be referred to the Ordinance Committee. Michael, um, I'll ask you to speak to the other topics that you have. I'll be happy to, Marion. Uh, the, the, the balance are, is just that the audience hasn't been looked at some time, and the other things happen over the years, and I notice there's some outdated references. The, also, the penalty provisions, uh, you know, most of the penalty provisions in most of our ordinances date back 30 years, and they're, they're really you know, not enough of a disincentive not to commit the, uh, the crime. Uh, so anyway, I'd like to have the Ordinance Committee take a look at uh, those things. Then there's other commercial filming. We have a, we have a provision that you need to get permits and pay, uh, pay fees to do it, but there's nothing in the ordinance that says if you don't get the permit, what happens? And this, this would give uh, that some uh, standing. And we always have the issue of weddings, and uh, this would, in the ordinance, allow a, the, the recommendations to allow a permit procedure for weddings attracting over 20 persons. The, the ordinance committee can debate that number, can debate the whole issue, uh, but it, it's just that you know at some point we might want to regulate weddings, you know, uh, and this would merely uh, give us the ability to uh, to say that the weddings need to be in a certain location if they're over a certain size. Uh, and possibly uh, as a fee-generating fee, uh, uh, proposal since, uh, while I'm not married, I, for those of you that have arranged weddings uh, uh, for family members or your own, you know that everyone else uh, collects fees and uh, it's, I think, the town of Cape Elizabeth, by hosting so many weddings, is the, the only entity that's not at all benefiting and all revenues by council policy generated within Fort Williams Park go to the benefit of the park. Uh, and this would, would help for the, the wear and tear and the, the, uh, the upkeep of the park. But this, this is not establishing the actual fees that would come later. This is establishing the mechanism for doing it. So I hope the Ordinance Committee would look at all those issues. Cynthia? Jim? Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Go. Uh, I'd just like to make a motion, if I could, uh, that we refer the proposed amendments to the Miscellaneous uh, Offenses Ordinance to the Ordinance Committee for consideration. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? 6-0. This is the beginning of what I think will be a lot of work for the Ordinance Committee, um, and particularly when the comp plan goes, starts to go through. The next item on our agenda is item 107, and that is proposed amendments to the flood plan management ordinance. Michael, do you want to speak to that? Or? I think it's self-explanatory. This okay. is a routine updating. So this is a, it is proposed to refer um, these ordinances to the ordinance committee, and I would make that motion. Is there a second? Second. Is there discussion? All in favor? 6-0. No, I didn't vote for that, Mary. You didn't? I'm no. sorry. I'm opposed. <laughs> Did you want to As a protest vote as the chairman of the ordinance committee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well done. <laughs> yeah, opposed? Uh -huh. <laughs> opposed? <laughs> okay. Well, wait till we get to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Item 108 is proposed amendments to health and sanitation ordinance, and Councillor McKenney um, is, as I mentioned, uh, at National Guard duty, so he was unable to be here. But he has requested a number of ordinances to um, basically deal, dealing with solid waste. Um, and so we are proposing that those, um, his proposed ordinances also be referred to the Ordinance Committee. And, I, and I, I'll just say for the public, um, uh, it, it includes things like pay per bag. And I think uh, Councillor McKenney was motivated, um, at least in part, by what we all perceive to be a rather sizable tax increase coming this year. Well, Anne? I, I have a question, because I'm not sure it does propose paper. Well, maybe he proposed paper bag, but I wanted to make sure I understood um, uh, the manager's description here. It said it would enable a pay per throw or paper bag system. It doesn't mandate it, right? It just would enable it? Yeah. Like it, it look, so many of these things, it sets up the right within the ordinance to do it. You, it would then give the council the right to implement it, 
to set the fees, to, to do those things, but it, it would need to be a two-step process. Okay. Thank you. Cynthia? Well, again, um, I'm going to move that this issue be referred, at least in part, to the Recycling Committee for a report. I, I just, I, I'm supportive generally of, of rewording the ordinance, but it seems to me we have a committee whose sole function is to study recycling, and this is all about recycling um, to a certain extent. And so while I know it will get to the Ordinance Committee eventually, hopefully it'll be after <laughs> my term ends, but um, I think the first step should be the Recycling Committee who would make a recommendation about um, these issues. All right, Michael? Yeah, I'd like to suggest that you have a joint workshop with, with the Recycling Committee and the Council. Committees get very frustrated if they work on something for quite a long time, thinking the council's behind it. And I think it would be, and I don't know if the council's behind these things or not, but I, I just think a collaborative discussion would, would work better. So a board. joint reference? Sure. You mean a joint reference to, to, to a workshop? To have a council uh, workshop, a workshop and, and the ordinance committee? committee or? Well, I'm wondering whether, I, I, I think it still should go to a committee to be worked. And I thought I heard you say the Ordinance Committee and the Recycling Committee, but were you saying? The Council. Council. council? I was saying the Council. So should we? Yes. I take walks frequently with one of the members of the Recycling Committee, and I feel pretty confident in saying that they would be on board with most of these suggestions. And I'm not suggesting we don't do it, but maybe we can work on it concurrently instead of because this is going to build in six months by the time we meet with them, talk about it, go back. So can we schedule both now and get their input? That, that's what I'm suggesting yeah. is a joint workshop with the Council and the Recycling mm. Committee. Uh, to be followed by the Ordinance Committee or? The Ordinance Committee would need to look at the technical language within the ordinance. Yeah, if I the guess policies so. seem to be su supported. So do we want to, wouldn't we want to refer to the Ordinance Committee as well as schedule for yeah. a workshop? Yeah. I think My suggestion would be you refer it to them, but with the understanding that before they begin to deal with it, There's the council workshop. is going to have a workshop and be with the Recycling Committee, and Good. by then, maybe Councilor Dale will be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I, I, I don't want to do a lot of work on an ordinance if it's not supported by sure. a majority of the council that of the Recycling Committee. That makes a lot committee. of sense. Okay. This is something thing that would take quite a while to do regardless as a lot. This is a very far-reaching proposal, but that has significant ability to, to greatly reduce volumes in Cape Elizabeth and reduce expenses, but also create a burden on those that use commercial haulers. So, uh, but it's, it's mainly mirroring what they're doing in other communities that there's communities much larger than us that, that bring 30 to 40 percent less waste to uh, Ecomain. We, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars could be saved mm. uh, with this proposal. Jim? Uh, I just had a question uh, to the manager. The first suggestion uh, would require all town departments to utilize best management practices in their own recycling. That sounds to me like it's more of just an administrative directive issue. Does, does that need to be addressed as ordinance? Uh, Paul? Uh, Council McKenney's recommendation through you, Madam Chair, uh, was that we require all town departments, school departments, to do recycling. Uh, you know, it's it's a little more complicated than that. Okay. And that's why I, you know, and that's what I was trying to mirror what he asked for. So I came up and I, you know, he responded by email that this best part, that he was okay with this language. Okay. Uh, but it's it's more to it. But, just as an aside, we did have a good meeting today with the superintendent of schools and the custodians and the person overseas looking at a comprehensive approach to recycling in the schools at all. Okay. Cynthia, you have a motion pending. But, but I could think. we have it repeated? But oh, I don't I'll withdraw the motion. Thank you. Is there another motion? Cynthia? I move that we schedule a joint workshop of the town council and the recycling committee to um, discuss the items described in uh, number 108-2008. Second. Okay, all in favor? That would be 6-0. Now, I guess I'd like to make a motion that we also refer to the Ordinance Committee with the understanding that the Ordinance Committee wouldn't start any work on it necessarily, 
until after the workshop. But I'd hate to have to Second. come back for another That's council fine. meeting to refer it to the ordinance committee. So, all in favor? Was there a second to that? Second. It was. Second. Sarah seconded. Sorry, just so, hear one. six zero. Thank you. Okay. I'm glad I'm not on the ordinance committee. It's a lot of work. You're an ex officio yeah. member of all committees. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, item 109 is uh, carry forward balances. Michael? Yeah, just I wanted to point out the it, it's your place this evening was a slightly revised uh, carry forward balances. I could explain the differences if anyone would like. Uh, but, you know, I think it's fairly self explanatory. It's basically money that we didn't spend this year. Yeah. It was in this year's budget that we will carry forward to the next fiscal year. That's correct. And um, we need a motion. Jim? Uh, I would move that we carry forward the balances that were included in the memo from the town manager uh, into the current fiscal year. Second. Second. I have a question. Okay, Cynthia? I just, uh, if we didn't carry forward the balances, they would last? That's correct. They go into the surplus. Surplus. That's correct. I'm I'm sorry. The fund balance. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, this further discussion. Seeing none. All in favor? Right. We haven't voted on this, right? Mm -hmm. Getting confused here. Okay. Six zero. Now, the last item on our agenda is item 110, the interlocal agreement to apply for fire grants. And the regional fire chiefs, that is South Portland, Portland Scarborough, Westbrook, Falmouth, and Cape Elizabeth are recommending an interlocal agreement that would permit regional applications for fire grants. Uh, the manager has recommended approval of this agreement and it's understood that any grant application would be subject to authorization by um, Cape Elizabeth Town Council and in fact the agreement provides um, for that for all town councils within those towns. So is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? It would be 6-0. Thank you. Now it's time for citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. <laughs> Seeing nobody but the members of the fourth estate here, we will just announce that um, the next town council meeting is Monday, August 11th at 7:30. Um, August meeting, and. Um, the members of the town council have been invited to a visioning session at the Thomas Memorial Library um, on July 23rd from 4 to 8 p.m. And like all meetings, that would be open to the public. So, uh, motion to adjourn. David? Uh, before we get to yes. the motion to adjourn, and you may have covered this and I just missed it, but I just wanted to make sure we didn't sort of leave an agenda item unaddressed. And oh. the last agenda item, 110-2008, there seemed to have been a second part to that. Um, and maybe that was encompassed in the motion that there be a separate recommendation for the council to uh, agree to participate in a separate yes. grant application. Thank you, covered? David. It was intended to be. It was, I intended to cover everything, but I well, clearly maybe, maybe, didn't. And again, well, maybe it was. No, I, I didn't. Sure we didn't. I didn't clearly up. make a motion in my haste to end our meeting. So I thank you for picking that up, and uh, we'll also move. Um, to uh, authorize the uh, approval of the application dated April 6, 2008. And, and I'll second that. And all in favor? Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we do need to schedule a workshop. And I think we adjourn first. Well, I, I think because I think we have a date. I think it should be August 11th, which seems to be the date that most people are available. And I know Wait, is not, that for windmills or for waste? That's for waste. windmills. So you have not there, and I'd love to be oh, at you're the You're not there either. Work. Okay, then we will do this offline. I thought we had agreement. Um, but um, So a motion to adjourn? 
So moved. Second. All in favor? Six zero. I was hoping to win that.